it's recording. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. We are about to get started to go through the first uh, six chapters of the incidents of the life of the slave girl. So we thank you for, for joining along. Um, I'm here with uh, Ms. Martha Cantu, a history Hello, instructor everyone. here at South Texas College. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off by we're going to have a kind of an informal discussion on these chapters. You might jump around a little bit, um, and then uh, we will open it up to questions. Let me make sure I've got those questions handy that were submitted to us ahead of time. Highly appreciate that. Thank you. Students that were able to send those. And that will be an ongoing um, opportunity for students to send these questions. It's helpful to us, so we do really appreciate it. Yeah, let's make sure that's open. Okay, and away we go. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So the book, Incidents of the Life of the Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. Um, this book is, um, it's not a light read. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's helpful to take this into chunks because it really is a an arduous task to read through this. We're dealing with human cruelty, uh, first and foremost. Uh, and almost every single page, uh, there is an incident of something that um, catches your attention and, and gives you a moment for pause. So I'd like to keep that um, respect ongoing through this thread that uh, we're dealing with real human beings uh, who once lived on this God's earth um, and this account from this woman, Harriet Jacobs, who's letting us know what was up, right? And so, yes, this is a spotlight on the life of an average plantation, right? This is how it went down in many cases for millions and millions of human beings, both enslavers and the enslaved. Um, oh, the sign-in, I'll, I'll post the sign-in sheet after, uh, towards the end of the talk. So remind me to do that because I will forget. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that'll be available later. So, um, and on this plantation, we're getting to see within the spotlight the interactions of the enslaved and the enslavers, the enslaved with their family members, uh, people associated with this plantation system, the support staff, the enslaved themselves, who are the support staff. Um, um, we get to see the grandeur, the opulence of the plantation. We get to see what it's like to have no agency over one's will, right? These people have, it's been, everything has been taken from them, um, page after page. Um, we are witnessing um, what power does to people who, who have un, unchecked power, right? And at, at the very heart of this, what we are seeing is what a patriarch looks like within the context of this time, right? Um, she never points, she never uses that word, but this is what happens to any human being who has um, absolute authority over other human beings, right? They're gonna do these insane things and not have a moment's thought or pause um, of how they are affecting other people, right? Like normal human beings, right? We're all fallible, we're all capable um, of such transgressions, not to this extent, but uh, hopefully. Um, but uh, these people in many ways um, are deficient, right? They don't have that opportunity for somebody to get in their face and say, what you're doing is wrong, you need to change course. Right. So Mr. Flint and Mrs. Flint, especially, well, both of them um, are terrible human beings uh, throughout this. Uh, the book opens up. Um, very interesting how this book opens up. Right. I was born a slave. Um, let me share screen. And here we go. So I'm going to bring up the PDF that's provided to all students. Okay, are you seeing what I'm, are you seeing the PDF of the book here? Is the PDF visible to everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
So it starts off, and this is very interesting. I was born a slave, but I never knew it till six years of happy childhood had passed away. My father was a carpenter and considered so intelligent and skillful in his trade that when buildings out of the common line were to be erected, he was sent for from long distances to be head workman on condition of paying his mistress $200, the person who owned him, um, $200 and supporting himself. He was allowed to work at his trade and manage his own affairs. His strongest wish was to purchase his children, right? But that is never going to come to fruition, right? So the book starts off on a happy note, except for the fact that this guy can't, well, the fact that he was even presented this opportunity of purchasing on children isn't a, a happy affair, but it starts off on a, on a good note. She's um, oblivious to the fact that she's an enslaved person. She has a happy childhood. She is born into a loving family on all accounts here. Um, her father is able to provide for the family. Her mother is incredibly loving. And uh, so loving that, yeah, they she's able to live this happy childhood and uh, establish healthy attachments to those that are caring for her and that she loves and people who love her. Um, so this is one <laughs> incredibly unusual for an the antebellum South. Um, I doubt many six-year-olds um, I, I'm, I'm quite certain many six-year-olds would have been well aware that they were enslaved, but she's shielded from all of this, right? She's living in a, um, by all accounts, it sounds like a very good home, a, a well-built home. Um, and so she's not on a plantation for her first six years of life. So she's probably even unaware that what is happening to other slaves, right? So, uh, Ms. Cantu, why don't, uh, is there anything you would like to open up with? I don't want to hog the whole <laughs> duration of the meeting. Uh, yes. So um, can you all hear me? <laughs> Did I unmute? Okay. So uh, yes, everything. Yes, 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 yes. Everything uh, you said, Sean. And um, when I wrote kind and mistress, because there is, I think we're going to see that uh, there are whites that are kinder, but yet not they don't they don't give them their freedom like they're not ultimately like the kindest of the kind but um there are i guess levels and uh grades of degrees of evil and degrees of niceness i guess i don't know how else how to put mm -hmm. that more eloquently but um so she says she had a kind mistress, which I, I think that's, like you said, that's kind of an oxymoron, like uh, a, a kind slave owner, because how do you own someone and yet you're kind? But OK, so um, she had a kind mistress. And then, of course, the kind mistress is going to die and uh, she's sent to the flints. Like you mentioned, the flints are the ones that are going to own her. Um, in my 1302 classes, we've talked about Henry Grady and how he says that the South was a slave to the system. So we've talked about um, uh, the Henry Grady. And so when you talked about Mrs. Flint and how unhappy her life is going to be, I thought of, of Henry Grady saying that it was they were a slave to the system, right? Because Mrs. Flint is going to know that uh, in, in most uh, plantation uh, owners, the females, right, um, will know that their husbands are having, are fathering children with the slaves. Um, and so was it uh, the Grim, one of the Grimke sisters that says, uh, in most plantations, white um, females can go to the neighboring plantation and know, oh, all these children are from the master, right? But uh, when they land, when they go back to their own plantation, none of them resemble her husband, right? So they're kind of blind to it. They, they want to be blind to that. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's a slave system 
that I, I reminded me of Henry Grady's thing. And um, all you, also you mentioned that they have no agency um, and often that the fact that they have no agency will lead to the fact that they have no happiness in their life, right? Uh, just small, I, I don't know, like passing moments maybe of happiness, but overwhelmingly they'll have this sense of doom that they can be sold away from their family members uh, on any infraction that they might, you know, uh, commit. And um, so there's this like no agency, no happiness. Um, they're under that patriarchal society that men are the ones that are um, ruling this. Um, they have absolute authority, like you mentioned. Um, and in the uh, book, if you will go up to like the first, first part of um, the childhood. Okay. Uh, is it, okay, right there. Uh, scroll a little bit further down uh, where she says that she was... Um, her right there, where it says, upon these, this is me, right? Can you, oh, you can't see me. But she also, just like you were mentioning that uh, Jacobs's father was uh, allowed to make money as long as he was clothing um, his children. I think you mentioned that, um, mm -hmm. but he, he wanted to purchase his children, right? But he had to pay the mistress, $200, did you say? Yes. Um, yeah. So um, the it, the grandmother also she talks about how the grandmother could sell her baked goods in the beginning. It's there in the in, in the in the introduction. The grandmother can have a little side business as long as she is able to pay for the food and clothing of her own children. So it's like you can make money. But you have to re like uh, give us a cut. Give us a cut and uh, take some of the financial burden off of us, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's going to benefit. If it benefits me, then you can do it. If it doesn't benefit you, I mean me, then you're not allowed to do it. Um, and uh, when mentioning this book with my students, I talked about how some of them. Uh, want to go into psychology and uh, the formative years of a child, how uh, they're so um, important, right? Crucial. Uh, uh, crucial, yes, as far as the identity, um, who they're going to be. And because she was not, she did not know that she was a slave, then she is, you know, oblivious and she is allowed to to I guess have a different identity separate from what a slave child would have uh, had yes yeah. and that's critical um, to understanding how this book unfolds too because she will comment later in the book about the poor souls out in the field right with no disparaging um, intentions towards them but the, the circumstances these people were born into the toil of the backbreaking work of picking cotton or tobacco or whatever the cash crop was um, from an early age on uh, with the constant threat of being brutalized, children taken away. This is uh, damaging to, the, to human psychology, uh, this constant threat. One cannot live under those circumstances. And it does have a cognitive effect on people. And so she comments that these people really don't know actually how bad it is. They're, right. There's talk about this new mistress that's going to come to this really dangerous plantation and how happy they are about this mistress. And she comments. And again, this is later on in the book about, I don't know, they don't know what they're getting into. This new mistress will be just as unhappy as any other mistress will be and will wreak havoc on these people's lives. Right. Uh, and um, if I also can add, um, mm -hmm. I, I think one of my students might have asked, like, well, what kind of job could a, a child have done? Right. Or how was it if she was the exception, then what is the rule? Right. Like how what what is the. And so I remember uh, reading Frederick Douglass and how he writes that at the appointed time, the slave child 
was taken to the big house, right? To the, to the plantation. And so um, he writes about how, I would imagine that it was three or four years old because she was six years old. So she's the exception. Um, at three or four, he writes about how his uh, grandmother uh, takes him to the big house. He had never seen the big plantation home. He had all, you know, because you have to imagine. Um, so you're a slave child. You're born in, a, in, in the slave quarters, in the little huts in the back, right? And not in the big house. Um, and so that's where their, their uh, childhood is. And so the grandmother is taking care of him because, of course, his mom, who would have been uh, stronger and younger, is the one that's working on in the field. So the old women are out uh, taking care of the children um, in the slave quarters because they can no longer work the fields. And so the grandmother takes him to the big house when he's at the appointed time. And then he says he's standing there looking at like, what is this? He turns to ask his grandmother something and the grandmother has gone, right? And so he has just like had his own little passage into slavery, into what would become his life as a slave. So I just kind of wanted to mention that because uh, just like she says, she's the exception. She didn't know. She was six years old. And so how do other little uh, slaves learn? It's through experiences like the one that um, Douglas describes. Yeah. Oftentimes they would be house servants, right? Tend to the household needs of their master and mistress. Um, and then when they got older and stronger, they would be sent to the fields most often than not, right? Um, she comments on the slave child when she's recounting um, um, this kind mistress who taught her to read and write. This is something else that's very unusual. She's literate at a very early age. The, the, the fact that she's literate at all is unusual for an enslaved person. Um, but she, she's recounting of just how kind she was. Like, yeah, she did have to work. She would sew clothes with her right at her side, though, while they were learning to read. She was never disagreeable uh, on her. When she grew tired, she would the mistress would say, go out and play, right? Come back later, right? These kinds of things. And so she comments here, those were happy days, too happy to last. The slave child had no thought for the morrow, right? Which is, I mean, that's a almost a throwaway line. You can kind of pass over that, but just imagine being a child, there's no hope for tomorrow, right? But there came the blight, which too surely waits on every human being born to be a chattel, right? And this is, this is too much for any human being, let alone a child, to bear. Did you uh, test so, um, so um, one of the things to be aware of when reading this book is the infusion of Christian themes in here, right? And she's getting this from her grandmother. <laughs> Her grandmother is high, a very devoted Christian um, who, and this is a lot of the care, obviously, right? This is the culture of the time. Christianity is very, very important. Um, her sense of Christianity is it's um, providence, right? God has a plan. So no matter how bad things are and how bad things will get, this is God's plan, right? And she sometimes chides uh, Linda, the, the pseudonym for Harriet, um, when she's feeling discouraged, right, about the situ the whole situation. And she she mentions this, that, you know, this is God's plan, right? Where Harriet, uh, Linda, is, is going to say, hey, this is not God's plan, right? This is, you know, she mentions this, that uh, at a brief, after a brief period of suspense, the will of my mistress was read, and we learned that she bequeathed me to her sister's daughter of a child of five years old. So now she's owned by a five-year-old, mm. right? <laughs> so vanquished our hopes. My mistress had taught me the precepts of God's word. So now she's, rec she's recounting her, her kind mistress, right? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, what, whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, uh, do ye on, so unto them, right? The golden rule. Um, she's recounting this, but I, but I was her slave, 
and I suppose she did not recognize me as her neighbor. I would give much to blot out from my memory that one great wrong being sold, right? As a child, I loved my mistress, and looking back on the happy days I spent with her, I try to think with less bitterness of this act of injustice while I was with her. She taught me to read and spell for this privilege, which so rarely falls to, um, to the lot of a slave. I bless her memory. Um, uh, so with that one, I think the question that would come to mind to, for some students is, if she had treated her so kindly, then why not give her her freedom before she died? So what I I, I know why, but I'd like to um, see what what would you say about that? Why um, why did he, the kind mistress, mistress not give um, Harriet her freedom? Based on what's written, it's hard to say. So we can only surmise, um, you know, just human fallibility, just the the thought of the, the power that comes with control. Probably social norms prevent yes, it as well. That that that's I All think right. that I think that would be my guess. Like you said, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's she doesn't tell, but um, but you saw we're gonna see later how the white woman that helps her escape that she mm -hmm. says, "Don't you ever dare, dare tell anyone that I helped you, or else they'll come after me." Yes. Right, mm -hmm. and so they knew that there would be repercussions uh, for people that were. Uh, but that would let leave their slaves to be free, right? Even though she was dying, I guess there would be uh, against the family for mm -hmm. doing that. Also, they were valuable, right? There was it was yeah. it was um, First money, money, right? Yeah. So, I, so I think that's one, like you said, the social norm, and two, if she's dying and she wants to give, you know, uh, money or like an inheritance. That's what she can give. Um, yes. It's it's surprising how, like in the beginning of the book, it talks about how the um, her grandmother was allowed to sell her her baked goods. She earns uh, money. She was saving up to purchase her children, just like um, Harriet's father was. And then she loans the money to her mistress, and the mistress doesn't give it back, right? Um, and so uh, it, I think throughout it it's threaded how terrible the white plantation owners were with money <laughs> and so yeah <laughs> that's that's what they have Good point in their that's the that's like the like their what is it commodities or their their wealth is in is in human um slaves mm -hmm. yeah that 300 dollars, and you know and she makes um almost light of this like you know uh, later in this passage, basically pointing out that okay, it, 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 every, even Northern readers will understand that a slave has under law no right to property. So, of course, mm -hmm. he's not going to be paid back. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Um, okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, this is just another example, another incident that mm -hmm. we can point to of, of, of this consistent thread of cruelty, right? This isn't like, oh, I just lost $300. Oh, well, I should have known better. This mm -hmm. is money she was putting aside to purchase her family, her children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is, you know, besides the fact that she's not getting paid back, it's, it's yeah, it, this is a real affront um, and something that uh, Linda speaks about and, and it's really unforgivable. Um, despite any semblance of kindness that might be put forward, right? Um, speaking of the litany of cruelty uh, and um, threaded through all of this horror, uh, one thing we need to be aware of is Harriet Jacobs is funny, right? It's subtle. You, you've got to really look for it, but Right. She's a funny lady. She she's very uh, sardonic, Sorry. Uh -huh. and and sarcastic. Humor. Yeah, uh -huh. and so like right here, right? She's bringing up Mrs. Flint. Mrs. Flint, like many Southern women, was totally deficient in energy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, that is such a good slight. Right, she had not the strength to superintend her household affairs. Damn. 
Mm -hmm. but her nerves were so strong that she could sit in her easy chair and this is where it gets dark and see a woman whipped till the blood trickled from every stroke of the lash she was a member of the church but partaking of the lord's supper did not seem to put her in a christian frame of mind if dinner was not oh, this is terrible if dinner was not served at the exact time on that particular sunday she would station herself in the kitchen and wait till it was dished and then spit in all the kettles and pans that had been used for cooking she did this to prevent the cook and her children from eking out their meager fare with remains of the gravy and other scrapping. So just, you know, just not, not good eating here. The slaves could get nothing to eat except what she chose to give them, right? And again, this is an example, right? Uh, you might be prompted to write about the lack of agency these slaves have. They can't even choose what it is they would like to put into their body, right? Provisions were weighed out by the pound and ounce three times a day. I could assure you she gave them no chance to eat what bread, um, wheat bread from her flour barrel. She, uh, she knew how many biscuits a quart of flour would make and exactly what size they ought to be. Right? Mm -hmm. this, this is cruel. This is mean spirited, right? Right. It, yeah. Goes on uh, to talk. Okay, go on. Sorry. Uh, just just before you move on from that uh, section, yeah, uh, Mrs. Flint, like many Southern women, that kind of puts me in the frame of mind, though, that remember who her audience is. It's the Northerners. And so she doesn't want to offend, I would imagine, like all white women. <laughs> it's the Southern women, right? So I, I think that's, that's kind of um, also like she's trying to thread that needle very carefully because yeah. she's she is writing to um to the white so just mention yeah. that specifically she is writing to northern white women of wealth and influence right mm -hmm. this is a letter to them um, right appealing to their christian faith mm -hmm. to their motherhood right pointing out all of this hypocrisy and pointing out how the enslavers are leveraging christianity right, to get their slaves to mm -hmm. behave um, and basically soiling the very message of Christian faith uh, in that enterprise. And so with the hope that maybe one of these um, women of means will be hobnobbing with the senator from mm -hmm. up north and say, hey, maybe do something about what's going on down there, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's her hope. And so she will break the fourth wall periodically and basically say reader and she's referring to <laughs> white women of means in the north listen right. to what's happening right so yeah be that's a real important part of this book be very clear i had some students indicate that she was writing to women of the south certainly she wouldn't say don't read this book but keep in mind most enslaved women of the south are illiterate so they're never going to read this book right, right. Um, so yeah that's a real real important thing to keep in mind here Right. Um, yeah, she goes on to describe Dr. Flint. We get introduced to Dr. Flint. Dr. Flint was an epicure, which is somebody, you know, who loves worldly things, good food, wine, women. Right. So she's letting us know straight up that this guy. And again, this would be something, an affront to kind of Christian faith. Right. Somebody who is heavily involved in earthly pleasures. Right. Mm -mm -mm. Right. That's the road to hell. Right. Mm -hmm. The cook never sent a dinner to his table without fear and trembling, for if there happened to be a dish not to his liking, he would either order her to be whipped or compel her to eat every mouthful in his presence. The poor hungry creature might not have objected to eating it, but she did object to having her master cram it down her throat till she choked. Right. It, it, this is what I mean. It's, it's, it's a difficult book to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can visualize this and th this is ugly. This is this is despicable what's happening here. Mm -hmm. It goes on to talk about this pet dog who dies um, from the cook's food. It was probably some rancid food, um, this Indian dish, uh, and then he makes the cook eat it as well. Right. It's it's terrible stuff here that's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, the jealousy. Question. Yeah, please. So I mentioned Dr. Uh, Dr. Flint, whatever he didn't like, he ordered her to whip the the slave or whoever made the order, right? Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't, so I guess he tried to, um, he ordered hers for her to look like the, the bad guy, that it's like kind of like blaming on her or for the slaves to be resentful towards her instead of him. Because like, oh, I didn't beat you, but she's the one that ordered for you to be yeah. beat, even though and I told her to do it. Yeah, and I imagine that would be commonplace. Right. You would get another slave to do the whipping or the overseer to do the whipping. Um, one, because, you know, if you can get other people to do your work for you, including inflicting violence on other people, that's that's what it's all about, man. This is the pleasures of being a yeah, master. But I mean, in my perspective, if we wanted authority in the house and the master would order the whipping himself, not the master tell me the spouse hey go tell the other guy to get for this person to get whooped like wouldn't it be him the master yeah right so the master's gonna be ordering to do the whipping is that what you're getting at anna yes it's because it's kind of uh, confusing because he said he would either order her to be whipped or compel her to eat every but it said here um order her to be whipped he would either order her to be whipped or compel her to eat every mouthful of his, his presence so he would order the slave to be whipped or he would order his wife to tell the person to get the slave to be whipped yeah i'm not sure um but this is not surprising right this is the pleasure of power right he's exercising his power um mm -hmm. and of uh, uh, a, a clear display of power, right? I'm so powerful, I can get other people to whip you, right? I don't have to act. You know, that's 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 a lot of work, right? To whip, you know, as ugly as this is, this this is a lot of 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 um, physical exertion uh, mm -hmm. in doing that. So yeah, of course he's going to get somebody else to do it. It demonstrates his power, right? It 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 demonstrates to other people that look at how much power I have over you. I get other people to do this. Um, yeah, um, um, yeah, and then the next paragraph, right, this, you know, this, uh, again, I, I apologize, but this is, this is the text, right, um, when I had been in a family, this is right here, this is still in chapter, um, the, the chapter two, the new master and the mistress, so this is, she's getting to know the lay of the land here, right, we're being introduced to this world, Right. And it's right from the get go. Right. So there's no grace period. Right. Uh, when I had been in the family a few weeks, so she's only been there a few weeks. She's still pretty young. Uh, one of the plant she's about 12, maybe 13. One of the plantation slaves was brought to town by the order of his master. Again, by the order of his master. It was near night when he arrived and Dr. Flint ordered him to be taken to the workhouse and tied to the joist so that his feet would just escape the ground. Right. That's torture in itself. Um, in the, in that situation, he was to wait till the doctor was taken his tea. I shall never forget that night. Never before in my life had I heard hundreds of blows fall in succession, right? So we're talking a great physical exertion here to, to do this violence on this person. Succession on a human being, his piteous groans and his, oh, pray don't massa, rang in my ear for months afterwards. So what we're seeing there is an ongoing traumatization of Harriet Jacobs, right? And, and this is true. I mean, just witnessing violence is traumatizing, right? I, I, I'm sure, you know, some of us, unfortunately, have experienced this. Um, uh, so uh, in, in, in that, uh, when you said trauma traumatization so two things uh this this scene uh was portrayed i don't uh, not from harriet jacobs but in the 12 years a slave 
um, I'm not sure if y'all have seen that movie, but there's a, there's a, uh, they have a, a slave hanging just, he's just tippy toeing, right. And he's trying not to hang himself. So this is kind of the same thing mm. that is, is happening there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, when you say traumatization that she is being traumatized by what's happening and I know there's a question we're going to get to on how the whites got, got so much power. But in in the 1950s, when Emmett Till was lynched, um, I don't know if you all have seen the movie or there's a great documentary on PBS for Emmett Till. But there's a, a, a another African-American young man that hears what's happening to Emmett Till in the in the uh, little cabin, whatever it is, the storehouse. Um, yet he doesn't get involved, right? He won't get involved. He's seeing the he is hearing, and I'm sure he knows what's happening. But because of that traumatization that they fear, right, the, that they're going to get it if they get involved. That's another way that they got power. Right, that they were traumatized, and that traumatization leads to like this helplessness and and this mm -hmm. just you know yeah. giving it up. Right on, right on, exactly right, and that's part of the power dynamic, right? So being traumatized, yeah, has a cognitive effect on you, right? You're mm -hmm. in flight or fight constantly, and mm -hmm. as such, your body is ready to either fight or get the heck out of there. You can't in this situation, right? So, so in the in the, I'm sorry, Sean, no, in no, in the in that Emmett Till movie and documentary, um, is they're like, "Did you see anything?" They're asking him. The whites are asking when mm. the ones that no, sir. Uh, lynched. No, sir. no didn't mm. nothing. Nothing. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That would be the the right thing to say in his situation. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just to protect himself, but his family members. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, in this in this paragraph, some said. Uh, some said the master accused him of stealing corn, uh, you know, so what? Right? There's, there's barrels and barrels of corn, but you know, this is all, she says, this is conjecture, right? Others said the slave had quarreled with his wife. Ooh, that's right. In his presence of the overseer and had accused his master of being the father of her child, right? They were both black. So she's saying, no, that ain't the case. Mm -hmm. And the child was very fair, right? So this is, again, letting us know of the systematic sexual assault that's ever present, that's center to this book, right? Um, another unusual thing about Harriet Jacobs' story is here is she is never, you know, she's never, um, fortunately, um, Dr. Flint never uh, sexually assaults her, but he is con consistently coercing her, harassing pressuring her, her bugging her, and he is, what is he, 40 years older than her? I think so, yes. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, again, this is why, yeah, this book, sorry, students, not just for this, but for assignment. I'm glad you're reading this book, but my gosh, it is, it's hard to take in. So mm -hmm. it's good to chunk this book, a couple of chapters a day, and then put it down, go for a little jog, a walk, right? Get some sunshine, because, yeah, this is an ordeal. Um. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to uh, add to this, Martha? I'm going to uh, go through some of the questions in the chat yeah. as well as in the pre. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we can get to the questions. What what time is it for? It's about 440. So that'll leave some yeah. 20 minutes. OK, so let's take a look here. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we've got uh, anonymous. Oh, um, OK. Oh, no, that was me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the author of. Uh, of this book captures the intricacies of enslavement while highlighting the empowerment of slave owners. It exquisitely sheds light on the resilience and sacrifices of the author who was trapped in the brutal system. Okay, so this is basically some insight that's brought. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. This, the author of this book captures the intricacies of enslavement. Yes, right? We. This is a, uh, one book that was very famous at this time uh, before this book was published was Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harry mm -hmm. Beecher Stowe, and a very good book, a good read, uh, but uh, the criticism of that book is she she's never had even visited the South, let alone going to a plantation. And so 
the characters come across as caricatures, right? They, they're, they're not really true to life. Um, and so a lot of the intricacies of enslavement are kind of lost in that book. Although you do learn something about slavery in that book, despite all of that. Uh, but here, no, it's clear, right? Very real human interactions with people. You can see their motives. You can see where they're coming from. You know, Mrs. Flint, you can not excuse her, but you can understand where she's coming from. Although she has many more rights than the enslaved people as a woman during her, her time, she doesn't have very ma many rights, right? She can't just leave uh, when she starts realizing that 11 of the children in the plantation were fathered by her husband. Um, it's not in her purview to do that. So right. we see the intricacies of the enslavement when she starts taking the stuff out on uh, Harriet Jacobs, right? Mm -hmm. And um, to get back, um, oh, I won't dig it up, but basically there's a passage um, when she's talking about the mistress that she felt bad for Mrs. Flint, right? Mm -hmm. and God, just one kind, th one kind thing, just one. And I would have been at her feet, mm -hmm. but she couldn't even give me that, right? But, you know, she looked at her and went, I pity you. I, and this is very common in almost every single slave narrative, right? I feel sorry for these white people. These right. people say that they're Christian. They, don't know, they have no idea what it means to be Christian, and they're going to hell. Right. They're going to hell for all of this, right? So excellent insight. Thank you very much. Who, who wrote that? Let me scroll over here. Cynthia, thank you so much, Cynthia. Excellent. Um, are you out there, Cynthia? Not sure. Um, uh, so in the book, Linda describes how she was unaware of her situation. Yes, excellent. As a slave until she was six years old, then has a decent life until she was 12. Yes, good observation. How often was this situation for slaves? Was it rare? Indeed, very mm -hmm. rare. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is what makes this book very interesting. Not only is, is her situation rare, but the fact that she's a woman publishing this book is rare. Uh, there's a lot of slave narratives, and I believe all of them, but this one is the only one published by a woman, uh, which gives it, because what we see here is the unique, this unique situation women had to endure as enslaved people. It, you know, it was awful for everybody, but particularly awful to women. One thing that we didn't touch on was this poor woman during the slave auctions on uh, January 1st. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Seven of her children sold in front of her. So uh, where, where they go, she doesn't know this. I mean, one is enough. Seven. Right. I mean, the number does is irrelevant at that point. And, and again, trauma, 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 not just for this woman, but this is something Harriet saw this. She saw this woman losing it. And she said for years, her screams, her groans were in, 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 enshrined into her mind. Mm. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Sean? I don't yes. know if I, okay. Uh, so when you were talking about uh, Harriet as a, as a writer, I remember reading how she writes. Um, she, she wrote that she, in her little time, she, uh, that every little second that she could get, she'd sit and write. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember reading that? Yeah. Um, and I thought about how even today, you know, some writers are like, oh, I have to get up at five in the morning and I can mm -hmm. write, you know, whatever. Writers and, write. and it, it, yeah. So th I found that interesting how, you know, a lot of people, including myself, are like, one day I'm going to write this or whatever. But she <laughs> actually took the time yeah. to sit and write. And she she was a writer. Um, when you're at and, the bar and you have somebody saying, hey, I'm a writer. And, you know, one of these days I'm going to write a book. And you're like, no, you ain't. <laughs> you ain't writing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I just, I just, Harriet Jacobs as a writer, um, that's something else that we could maybe look at later. Yeah, um, significant. Yeah. So, so you were going to go through the questions. Yeah, the last question here that we have, and then we'll get to the chat questions. This one is from one of your students, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Danielia. Uh, excellent. Thank you. How did children as early as six years old uh, could be used as slaves? Good question. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, how can someone be property to a child when they are, chi uh, yeah, child themselves? Yeah, so her one of her uh, owners was five years old. Uh, 
And this is something that Dr. Flint would say, yeah, I would love to sell you, but mm -hmm. my daughter owns you. So, hey, my hands are tied. What yeah. can I do? Right. Um, yeah, this is the legal system. It's, it's slavery is systematic with the law. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is all about money. Right. And so we're talking about commodities here as as crude as that sounds of these human beings is, and, and children. Right. Um, this is what we're talking about here. So this is the law. This is the culture. This is their way of life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's despicable. It's 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 disgusting. And it it creates monsters out of these people as young as five years old, as young right. as five years old. And uh, isn't it Thomas Jefferson who says that one of his earliest memories is being carried by a slave? Uh, I think I think I've read that about him. So it's just it's it's in their in their upbringing, the whites as as well as the um, African slaves, African American slaves. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Jefferson was an interesting cat. He definitely was ambivalent about the whole thing. He was born into it, so it brought lots of pleasure to him. But uh, he he understood that this this was wrong. It couldn't stand. It would eventually destroy mm -hmm. the country. And he predicted in 1820 that this would bring about a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, Lynn writes um, in the chat, it does sound ridiculous, evil though it may be, have been, when you just lay it out there, how uh, did something like it happen? It couldn't happen again, could it? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> it ha it's happened before. And yeah, this is not, yeah, this, I mean, we're, we're seeing uh, with mass shooters, um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are motivated by racial animus, right? And they're worried. They've gone down some dark rabbit hole that uh, the white man is going to lose this country. And just like these people, they think they're doing the right thing. These these unfortunate people lost who, who commit these horrible crimes uh, are, are thinking they're doing the right thing. So, yeah, it can happen again. It's There's slavery that exists today, right, uh, right yes. here in this country. Um, it's not legal, so that's, I guess, some progress. But... Um, it's, you know, slavery is as old as civilization, right? And what makes American slavery unique is the racial component to it, right? You had an entire group of people just by the mere appearance of them, the dark skin, not so dark for Harriet, Harriet Jacobs was a fair woman, right? And so was her family. And this right. is a product of probably most likely rape. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, it can definitely happen again, right? Progress. Um, out the, the things that we take for granted about how enlightened we are should never be taken for granted. It's a it, fight to maintain it. It just happened, I think, in was it somewhere in England, maybe in London, that some people hit hit the street. They were, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure they were Asian. I don't know if they were Chinese or what, but they were being basically enslaved in in um, there, and they made a run for it. Um, oh, yeah. I know. I, I see Christopher uh, Christopher Nelson Dean Nelson's uh, Yoselin's original question was better. Um, did he ask a it, question? Yes, and it was how did the whites get so much power? Because I wrote it down because I wanted to address it. Okay. Um, and I, I would say by keeping the um, African American slaves ignorant, right? Where they there were those laws were meant to keep them from learning how to read, learning how to write. And when I address this in my, um, in my classes, uh, we talk about how, um, for example, in the Middle East, um, the Taliban, right? They want to keep women from having an education from, uh, and it's like, keep them ignorant so we can keep control over them. Because mm -hmm. once they become um, educated, well, now we just, we can't keep them, you know. Uh, so through ignorance, through traumatization, which we've already mentioned, um, through the slave trade, through, you know, uh, being worried that they were going to be sent off, separated from their families, which is another reason how they, how they had so much power. Uh, whippings, you know, um, so there was, they would be whipped or they could see somebody else being whipped, which would provoke that trauma, cause that traumatization. 
but I don't know if you will have other something else to add to that. Sean. Yeah, no, very insightful in all of that. Um, yeah. And I think probably the most uh, pressing issue for an enslaved person was the threat of their children being taken away from them. I, I can't imagine mm -hmm. that my son being taken away from me. Right. And this yeah. is, you know, I mean, it's bad enough if your child was taken away, but this is before modern technology. It's not like you can keep track of them on Instagram. Right. Right. They're gone. Right. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Gone. Mm -hmm. You will. You, you could go your whole life and never hear from them again and have no idea where they were at. Uh, one more question. Did white men father these children on purpose? Um, now they own more slaves and can turn around and sell them. Yes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they fathered them on purpose. Right. This is this is the one of the fundamental problems, the patriarchy, right? They have absolute authority and they control everybody's will and no checks on, on their their the power that they have, right? Not even from their wife, right? Their wife is powerless mm -hmm. in this situation. And so yeah, it's and yeah, indeed, uh, good insight right here. Um they can turn around and sell them, right? So this is more insidious, this is economic, right? This is a product. That I could sell. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absurd. But the way it was. Question: Is it fair for a child to take on a father's color, even though the mother may be of African descent? Um, do these children still get enslaved? I'm not talking about slightly light. If they were born white, what then? No, one drop of blood and you are mm -hmm. black, right? There was a term used. It's a ridiculous term called the octoroon. This is what Homer Plessy was. He, he would definitely pass as a white man, right? He mm -hmm. uh, was an activist, though, and he wanted to ride that first-class train and made the conductor aware of that and was kicked off, went to court, the Supreme Court, Homer versus Plessy, right? Or Plessy versus... Uh, um, but, uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, there's this no is, exception. Yes, and she also mentions that with her... Was it her son that he was at a, at a trade school and then they realized that he is... Uh, he had an uh, uh, Harriet Jacobs son mm -hmm. uh, will have that happen to him when when they realize that he does his his mom is an African American um, that he's kicked out of the school because so he because Her we're spoiling it already for the That's next okay. <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert she has a child with uh, a white man Harriet Jacobs does mm -hmm. and um, and so he's at a trade school. And uh, the people at the trade school find out that he has an African-American mom, which how did they find out? So they were thinking he was white. And that's when he's, oh, well, you're not smart enough now and you got to go. So that happened. Yeah, right. Um, and it, it, it lays bare the hypocrisy of all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I submitted my question on the forum. I don't know if it went through. Uh, do I submit it here? Yeah, I read all the questions. So if you didn't hear me read it, Carlos, yeah, go ahead and submit it here. Uh, we've got a question up here. What kind of role did pregnant slaves take on? They seem to have fairly large families as far as it's presented. Yeah, that's something else that we uh, didn't mention um, earlier in the book. Um, they talk about, I believe, er earlier in uh, Aunt Martha, the grandmother's life, she was a wet nurse. And mm -hmm. it, this is another incident where control is imposed right she had to take her child's away from her breast in order to take her mistress's child to her breast right and so now her child her own child is going without sustenance in order to sustain the person who owns her child right so that would be their role in many cases um they would have to work Right there, you know, it's not like you get maternity leave as an enslaved person, mm -hmm. right? So, especially field slaves, they would be out in the field doing the work, traumatizing yeah. in itself. Right, and and yeah. her, as she writes about her aunt, had never was able to have a child because of that, because she always had miscarriages because she would have to work and work and work and raise the white, um, her, her white mistress's family. So when I, I don't know how many times she was uh, pregnant, but she miscarried. Uh, because she kept working right through them. Yeah. Oh, good question from Irina. Um, did it happen that people never found out a kid isn't fully white, but white passing? Uh, maybe. I, I, I doubt it, though, just because of the economic incentive, right? You would want to put that child on the on the slave auction. 
So and then it would be known. Uh, what, uh, Carlos, why was it considered a crime for a slave to say who, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, because, you know, this is all done in the shadows, mm -hmm. right? This is not something that the Mr. Flint would have been proud of. He, you know, he tried to keep up appearances. So um, it, it would have been um, a, a great sign of disrespect of an enslaved person to make this public. And so it would have been kept quiet, kept in the shadows. He doesn't want his wife to find out. Right. So, yeah, a, a mother would have kept that very close to her sleeve. Um, right. And the father would never acknowledge his children. Right. Those aren't his children. They are his children, yeah. but he would never acknowledge them as children, as his own children. I believe one was sold for telling and beaten, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, probably. Yeah. I'm not sure specifically if that happened, but I wouldn't uh, be surprised. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, any other questions from students or any last insight from students? This is great. This is, I'm glad we had these uh, pre-planned questions because this is, gives us a chance to really go over what you guys are getting out of the book, which is what this is all about. One thing, while if there's any questions coming in, one thing to be aware of kind of the historiography of this book is that this book was not assigned to high schools or college students until about the 1970s, mid-1970s through the work of, and, and the result, why that is, is uh, Anne Marie Childs is the original editor of this book. She was very well known. Uh, she was an editor, she was a feminist, an abolitionist. Uh, and Harriet Jacobs, when she penned this manuscript, was having problems getting this book published. Um, and uh, finally, she ran into some editors that said, well, the problem is that, you know, nobody knows who you are, so you don't have any credibility in the publishing world. So let's get Maria Childs to edit it uh, and write the foreword to this book. Um, so after it was published, one, it, it's published shortly after the Civil War starts, so people have their minds on other things. Uh, but thereafter, it was believed that this was the fiction of Maria Childs, right? She created <laughs> this. And so... Yeah. Uh, racism, misogyny is at play here, sexism, right? So, you know, to discount a, a woman actually wrote this book and wrote it very well. This is, you know, as, as hard as this book is to read as far as the incidents are concerned, uh, it's a very well-written book. Um, so it was discounted. No way a, a enslaved woman wrote this book. So a historian named uh, Fagan um, from Eddington, North Carolina, where this all takes place, uh, looked into it and she verified almost everything. She verified that these people were real. Her, the, the Harriet, uh, the, the person who fathered Harriet's children was a congressman, right? And so mm -hmm. he was easily verified. Uh, uh, Dr. Flint is, uh, his last name is Norcom, right? So it's all, it, the documentation was all there. There were letters that were written back and forth, including from Harriet, who fooled Dr. Flint, um, who, who he was trying to find her after she escaped, spoiler alert. Um, and so he, <laughs> he, she would write, hey, I'm in Chicago, come find me, right? And, uh, like she, and she wasn't. And so uh, very, very clever person there. Um, but uh, yeah, so around mid seventies, this book slowly starts to become um, assigned to students and to this day, it's becoming more and more a sign. So here, we're very fortunate and very grateful to Professor Fagan. Uh, okay, let's see. We, oh, we got a lot more questions. Um, I'm pretty sure they would disown them and maybe out of regret and disgust. Yeah, good point. Yes. Uh, what were white women's roles back then if black women were doing their chores? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, what were white women sp uh, supposed to do if they couldn't <laughs> do the chores? Uh, what were they supposed to do as a woman back in the day? Uh, look, you know, I'm sure they had to do some household chores, but, uh, you know, they were the mistress of the of, of the plantation. And they got all the pleasures of the prestige that would come with that. They would entertain, right? They would yes. uh, uh, make sure they would rule the, the home itself, right? Make sure that the enslaved people were in order and doing their duties and discipline them as we see through this book, spitting in their food, right? This sort of thing. That's what they would do. Uh, it's, so, it's you know, besides that, just being miserable and jealous all the time. So um, Genevieve also, sorry, Sean. No, no um, 
say uh, uh, ask do the what did the white slave owners who fathered children with slaves ever show any remorse uh for the things they do oh, they did yeah. um so the white congressman that you mentioned that harriet jacobs is going to have children with um he buys them right but uh even harriet jacobs says that he really didn't have like a father child relationship it was just you go over there and um, so it, it, i guess the 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 natural feelings between fathers and and their children if it was a white man i would say i would think and a slave that wasn't it wasn't seen as as loving in most cases and some it was i i, I watched um henry lewis gates on uh, finding your roots and um in one of the uh, episodes uh they they figure out that the before the the before the civil war a white slave owner had had children with a slave lots of them and then in the census after the civil war the white uh, slave owner left his white family to go live with the um, African-American um, slave. I actually think it was the um, the uh, descent uh, ancestors of Jay Johnson, our uh, secretary. He was the secretary of Homeland Security under the Obama administration. Oh, really? And it was his uh, his great, 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 great somebody that left um, his white family to go. And when they tell Jay Johnson, like, you know, your great grandfather did this and he's just not happy to know that his, he had a former, you know, white slave owner in his family. And he's like, I'm not going to disavow this. This is my family history, you know, but he's not happy knowing about that. Yeah. But I'm sure that was the exception to the the rule. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, this is ongoing. The legacy, the momentum of, of all of this is still with us. What would the baby that ended up taken from the breast eat? Um, yeah. Good question. I don't know. Probably <laughs> nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the point. Um, what were white women's role? OK, we read that one. Uh, was religious faith a requirement for slaves? Um, how was this passed on to them? What was the point? And was Harriet the exception? No, she was of the faith. Um, she just had a different approach to it. She was, she wasn't going to take any of this and she knew it was wrong and this wasn't God's plan. But, uh, yeah, um, in many ways, um, uh, you know, beginning with the American revolution, these poor slave owners start coming under attack, uh, first from the Quakers, right? And then the rhetoric of the American revolution is, putting slavery in the spotlight. All men are created equal. Oh, really? Right. Um, and so for the first time in human history, right, slavery has been around since the birth of civilization. Slave owners are having now to defend their trade. Right. Um, and so one of the ways to um, basically excuse some of all of this is that hey, you northerners who are criticizing us, you guys don't get it. Right. These poor heathens, if they were back in Africa, and many of them were born in the United States, so that's nonsense. But anyway, um, if the, if we weren't giving them the good word, then they would be damned to hell. So we're doing a good thing here. So back off, right? So uh, yeah, it would be passed on to how any you know you would go to service, right, to worship, right. You would hear the scriptures. You would go through the rituals, um, and it was very important to them. This wasn't an imposition. They they gladly accepted it was part of their culture, right? They, they were born into this world. So this wasn't an imposition. The hypocrisy that they would see through the lens of Christianity and how enslaved, um, acted, enslavers acted uh, bothered them probably a lot, including Harriet. And she makes that point threaded throughout this book. Well, um, what was the point? And was Harriet the exception? No, she was of the faith. Um, wait, but the wife of the white men wouldn't know that he was having kids with slaves oh they knew they knew it was it was it was very apparent right so you would see resemblance of your the fair children slaves um resemble the father and they they would know uh um yeah they definitely would turn a blind eye right they'd have a lot to lose if they didn't uh that's so inhumane yes I hear you, Brooke. Yeah. 
though, even if they were mothers themselves, would they actually feel bad? Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's hard to say, right? I imagine late at night going to bed that the dark night of the soul would would approach them uh, and they would have to be faced with their thoughts. Uh, do the white slave owners whose father's children were slaves ever show any... Oh, yeah, we went through that question. Excellent question. Um, yeah. Or auction them drink tea. What? But maybe ended up taken. Oh, maybe I don't know, but maybe they were given food by other. Okay, this is just commenting on that question by the new owner. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. And eventually, yes, because the baby doesn't take it. They they they, they were going to let you know. <laughs> uh, like if there was like a slave mom was breastfeeding. Um, what happened to the slave baby if the slave master if the if the mother passed away? Child, child. Oh, there's high mortality rates, so that child would probably be doomed to death. Uh, in most cases, but yeah, I don't know specifically in every incidence what would happen. There would be other people that would take care of the child, other enslaved mothers or women would probably take care of the child mm -hmm. after that. Uh, yeah, good question. Yeah. Any other questions before we leave or any last comments before we conclude? We want to keep it as close to an hour as possible. Excellent. We've got lots of people, lots of students here. This is yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Just, I think the sign-in sheet is what oh, somebody that's... was asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the sign-in sheet. Oh, okay. the All extra right. credit. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, yeah, I'm going to put it right here in the chat. Um, oh, let me make sure it's going to everybody. I did that once before. Everyone in meeting. Okay, here we go. So it is now in chat. Have at it, guys. <laughs> let me know if it's not editable. It should be. Let me verify that. While it's in front of me. Yeah, okay, it is. I'm seeing people jumping into it already. Okay. Well, this will conclude the session. Um, we're still, you know, while we're waiting for everyone to sign in, please let me know if anyone has any last questions or comments. Um, won't let me edit it's letting everybody else edit so try it again maybe refresh the page i'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and i will this usually takes doesn't take